Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here to uh, share some nuggets of information. And I'm no expert in Gen Z, but I have three that live in my house. So <laughs> you can pray for me on that. I actually tested some of this against them, and it's real. It actually works. So uh, hopefully today's session will, uh, will address some of this uh, new generation and, uh, and how we can effectively serve them um, in the areas that we particularly work in. So about eight years ago, um, I did a topic on gen, uh, the millennial generation. Some of you may have been in that session. It was a while ago, and we looked at what the millennial generation, their characteristics, their traits, their behaviors, and how that affected us in college athletics. Um, well, we're now into Gen Z. And it's probably appropriate we're looking at this now because they've actually been on your campus for about two years, if you haven't noticed. Uh, that the new generation is there. Um, and so it's kind of appropriate, I think, maybe to transition into looking at Gen Z and what that looks like for us um, coming down the road here. So let me um, share a story with you. So uh, I grew up in uh, Iowa, and my grandpa uh, lives in a small town outside of Ames. And when I was a kid, I was in his car, and we stopped by a stop sign, and a long-haired teenager on his bike, went right through the four-way intersection. And my grandpa said, kids these days, they're not good for anything. And I said, well, I'm one of them. He goes, except for you. <laughs> but I said, well, grandpa, what was it like when you were a kid? Oh, don't tell your mother, but we used to hotwire tractors and chip over cows. And I said, so you weren't so good either when you were a kid, were you? He just kind of smiled and kept driving. And my thought was, every generation thinks that the next generation is out of control that they're bad, and, and so forth and so on. But that's not the reality, because we all were that generation at one point in time, no matter what you are. Um, I'm going to reference a lot from uh, Dr. Jean Twenge. She is a research psychologist at San Diego State University. Uh, she is an expert in Gen Z, a uh, leading expert. She's written a book, and this is a long title iGen, why today's super connected kids are growing up less rebellious, more tolerant, less happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood, and what that means to the rest of us. And this video I'm going to show you in a second is her speaking about this. But uh, a couple things to think about. Uh, what is a generation? Just so you know, uh, last time we talked about, we looked actually what generations were. We're not going to spend time doing that. But here's the definition of a generation. It's all the people born and living about the same time regarded collectively. It can also be described as the average period, generally considered to be about 20 years, during which children are born and grow up, become adults, and begin to have children of their own. 20, 25 years. That's typically how long a generation is. Generations are usually named based on characteristics of what they, people see, behaviors that are happening, traits, or a time of events, like the baby boomers. That's an event name of a generation. So it can be based on character traits or an event of time. So we're at Gen Z right now, which we'll talk about more. It's basically 1996, 97, 98 on. No one gets to, no one gets to determine when actually when a generation starts, but that's basically what it is. Millennials are now uh, come and gone through basically our colleges, and some of them in this room are probably millennials working for us. Then there's Gen Xers and baby boomers. Back to baby boomers. The baby boomers was actually the first generation to ever be named. Now they've gone back and renamed generations before baby boomers, but, but starting with baby boomers, that was actually the first generation to be named. So I'm going to show you a video, about a four minute video. And while we're doing this video, showing this video, I want you to think about um, what you're hearing from the video that maybe is due to you. Even as I watch this video after reading this book, I write, oh, that explains a few things. So there's, this video is going to demonstrate that. But before we do that, I want you to sit there, and if you've got a pen or in your mind, I want you to think of four things that you would use to explain Gen Z. Just four things. If you could give four things, I'm not going to give you any hints, but four things you would say, this is what I see with Gen Z, this generation. Because we're going to test those four things against what you hear today. So let's try that. So four things that you think that you would say, this is what I think Gen Z stands for, is about, behaves, characterizes them. Got them? On sake of time, we'll stop there, but test those against what you hear today. So let's take a look at this video. Generations are really about cultural change. 
By studying generations, we can get an idea of how growing up now as a child or a teen is different from it was for, say, the Gen Xers growing up in the 80s or the boomers growing up in the 1960s. Looking specifically at numbers, we define Gen Z as those born between 1995 and 2012. 1995 just happens to be the year the internet was commercialized, so that also captures the generation of people who were born um, after the internet existed, who don't know a world without the internet. So compared to previous generations, they spend a lot more time communicating with their friends electronically, and they also spend less time hanging out with their friends in person. Well, my generation, we're truly digital natives. We've really only known a world where our phones are smart. You know, we turn to technology for a lot of things, whether it be entertainment, research, education. It's truly just part of who we are. I'm not entirely convinced that iGen's uh, skill with social media is going to be a complete positive. It's also linked to depression and anxiety and unhappiness especially for people who are spending too much time on social media, who are comparing themselves to others too much. You know, people always talk about taking digital detoxes and stepping away for a little bit, and I don't know if it's necessarily cutting out the phone for a month at a time, but understanding that it's okay to put down your phone for a couple hours, don't have it at the dinner table, try not to be on your phone right before bed. There's just time and a place for everything, and I think understanding that is really important. I think something that parents can do to help with this anxiety, the phones and information overload, is really helping them sort of analyze and prioritize the information is what we find is something that's definitely needed with this generation. At the moment, uh, what many people think of when they think of iGen is a teen or a young adult, you know, looking at his or her phone. Um, but I think they'll become known for other things as time goes on. One of our traits that you know, is very upfront with my generation is that we're very, very realistic. At a young age, we were thrown into a world that you could say wasn't the prettiest. You know, we grew up amongst the 2009 recession after 9-11, and our parents didn't tell us we could necessarily be whatever we wanted. They told us that it's a hard world out there. You're gonna have to work your butt off, and if you're not willing to, there's plenty of others that will. Gen Z entering the workforce, it's gonna be a lot of change. For Gen Z, if I can log on and log in, I'm at work. So I think the physical office is really going to be challenged. Another thing that we know about this generation they're really going to challenge is the pace at which things get done. And everyone talks about work-life balance, you know, I got my work and my life and works from nine to five and then your life and how do we balance the two. What I love about Gen Z is they just don't think it works and it really hasn't worked. What they go for is work-life blend, where work and life are seven days a week, 24 hours a day. By spring of their senior year, iGen teens are less likely, compared to previous generations, to have their driver's license, to work at a paid job, to go out on dates, to drink alcohol. And we've already seen this with millennials in young adulthood, taking longer to settle into careers, to marry, to have children, uh, and so on. So the whole developmental trajectory is slowed down. Gen Z is by far the most diverse generation ever, and we're also the most interconnected around the globe. And part of the reason is, you know, now with our generation, when something happens, the entire world finds out immediately through social media, through hashtags. We're always connected to each other, so we're, we feel as though whether it happened in the same building or a thousand miles away, it is Im immediately affecting us because we hear about it, and so there we feel obligated to help and be a part of the situation, whether it's positive or negative. They are also the one that values equality quality the most, whether we're talking about race or gender or sexual orientation or transgender issues. Um, they're really much more open um, and focused on equality. And we really do not fear failure, so whether it be through political activation or entering new workplace or trying new things, we're willing to try something and fail. And this is going to have a great impact on the other generations. For the rest of us who have been so cautious, that's going to really rub off to get us to step outside our box and maybe try some new things. So hopefully you heard a few things in there that may be even new to you. And um, once again with my three kids at home, I can tell you that some of that relates. I can understand um, the driver's license issue and the job issue. Uh, my oldest son uh, wasn't thrilled to get his driver's license at all. My second son couldn't wait to get his, but there's a difference there. Uh, people are taking longer to get their driver's license. They're, they're waiting longer to get married. They're waiting longer to have kids. Uh, it's, it's a different um, adulthood track, as they say. Here's a slide. I know you can't see it very well, so I have a handout. 
of a little bit different too on your way out. I'll certainly have it made available here. Let me go with a few of these things. So who is Gen Z? Let's dig into the data. They send over 100 texts a day. 73% are on their phone within the first hour of the day. 88% of them are extremely close to their parents. That's up from the millennial generation, about 6%. So they're very close to their parents. 76 are concerned about the human impact on the planet, and they really, really want businesses to focus on mission of helping others. They want to work for a school. They want to work for a business and an industry that's sole goal is to help improve society. Like he said, they're realistic and they're altruistic. 55% feel pressured by parents to have a professional experience. My kids would say that's what dad does to them too. Get out and have some experience in life. 74% want to work for themselves. 74%. Half will be university educated. That's actually up from the millennials, which was a third. So there, there are lo there's still kids that want to go to school. Even though we have enrollment struggles, it's how they go to school, which has changed a lot. They're concerned about privacy. 42% are sharing less than they did two years ago. Another story, I'm gonna give you a bunch of side stories. We have this computer at home. My son has so many firewalls, security protections on there, I can't Google anything. I can't Google Google half the time. <laughs> he is so concerned about giving out information because of things that breaches that Target has had and US Bank has had and you name it, that they wanna protect their information. He's very private about his information, which he's a 17 year old, probably more so than I am, if you will. Dad, you know where that's gonna end up. You know where that's gonna go. They're gonna use this, that. So they're very protective of their information and their privacy. They spend seven and a half hours in front of a screen a day. Now, that seems like a lot, but that's actually no more than other generations who would use that with television or other things. So that, but their screen is different than what's, di what's different. Nine out of 10 are optimistic, so this generation is very optimistic, which is great. And 65% worry about the economy in general because they saw the 2009 when they were little kids, potentially saw the 2009 and 10 um, economic struggles. So what do they use? Their most used devices. Look at the millennials and Gen Z. The, mill the millennials use their desktop computer most, followed by their smartphone and then the, and then the television. Gen Z uh, uses their smartphone the most, the television less, and they have a laptop. You see desktop's not even part of that anymore. Desktop is considered archaic to, to this generation. We used to have direct TV. After paying the bill and figuring out why we have direct TV, we dropped it. My kids do not watch TV, and they're, they are athletes. They get everything on YouTube, everything on YouTube, what they want to find. Uh, so we saved some money, and I, I missed the Big Ten Network, but I heard YouTube TV has it, so I'm going to try that out. But my kids, we were paying for something we weren't even using. They do not watch TV. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, and not, at least not as much as the generations before them. You can kind of see this. Look at the weekly TV usage from the boomers down to Gen Z. Weekly. And I would say it's going to probably even continue to shrink. Uh, it's dropped look, almost in half since uh, two, two, two and a half generations ago. Now, social media, what do they use? Well, the millennials used Facebook. They used Instagram and YouTube and, and Snapchat and I don't even think Google Plus exists anymore and Twitter, but look at the difference. And I'm gonna tell you a key, a key reason why, but let's look at this. So Facebook has dropped. Facebook is for old people, if you ask my kids. Instagram is up. Athletics departments should be using Instagram because it's way up and I've heard Instagram stories are completely up. YouTube is way up. And it's, and the uses of YouTube and Snapchat are, are, have, have almost doubled. And Twitter. Those are because they're quick hitters. Every one of those is a quick hitter. How do they want to be communicated with? They still appreciate face-to-face, -face, half of them do, which is great. That's not out, that's not completely out. And, that, and when we talk about coaching and recruiting, we're gonna hit more on this. But they like texts. They will, they will communicate on the phone, but they will not check their voicemail. Most of them haven't set their voicemail up. I think Sprint did a study on millennial, on Gen Zs that have uh, voicemails. Less than 30% have ever even set up their voicemail. They don't set, they don't even know how to use their voicemail. Because they look at the phone, they don't answer it, they don't answer it. So leaving voicemails is still okay, but they may not even check that. And email is still hanging in there, but very, very little. They actually don't, they don't want to communicate through social media from adults. That's not their mode of communication, if you will, back and forth. Reality blurred, I called this slide. So let's take the reality and test against what they think, okay? 
So here's what a Gen Zer thinks. 42% want to work for themselves in their career. 42% want to work for themselves. 75% think they're going to, but when it really comes down to 42% think they will. 11% of America is currently employed by them, uh, self-employed. So the reality is somewhere in there that either the number is going to go up or they're going to realize that they, don't, they can't work for themselves. But 42% believe they are going to, which leads to their entrepreneurial spirit. They are very entrepreneurial, actually. 36% expect to pay for college, mainly with scholarships or grants. That may be good at your school, but not at mine, I can tell you that. But they think that that's, it's all going to get funded through scholarships and grants. The reality is that 60% of undergrads received grants in 2011, when the last time a study was done. They've updated this since 2017. It's up to about 65% are now receiving some kind of a grant, but the grant amount has gone down. So they're trying to spread their wealth out to more students to try and recruit them to your campus, but the actual amount of the grant has gone down since 2011. They want to pay $100 a month for a student loan over 10 years. They think that's fair. What's reality? Right now, the average is 242 over 15 years. So the difference between what they think they're going to pay in student loans and what the reality is, is two, two and a half times more. So the reality is a little bit blurred. 29% considered 100,000 annual salary rich. They think if you make $100,000, 3% say you're rich. 22% of Americans earn 100,000 or more, and they would not say that they're rich. They would say that they're potentially just getting by also. 17% 17 expect, 17 expect to pay for college with student loans, some student loans. The reality is, and this is an old stat, and I'll give you the new one, in 2011, 67% of undergrads receive loans. It's now 72% are using loans to pay for school. And we hear about it every day. We are, we are getting hammered about student loan debt. You and I are in colleges because of the fact that kids are taking out student loans and they think that the cost of education has gone too high. Okay, let's do a little more comparison. Gen Z's versus millennials, because many of you have coached both are, are in that area. I'll go over a few of these. The years of birth uh, is 1995, 96, 97 to current actually, to th almost 2012, but really maybe to 2015. So the next generation is actually forming who are getting born right now, by the way, who are getting born right now. Their attention span is shorter, hate to tell you. It's shorter than the millennial generation. And this is all data based in this book you can certainly read. Uh, their patience is shorter because their t attention span is shorter. I like this, though. They're, they're actually a little bit less frugal. They're actually okay to spend some money because they think that now the economy has gone away. They're a little bit less frugal than the millennial generation. So hopefully for our education, for enrollment, they're willing to spend a little bit more for the value they get at our institutions. They're a little bit less frugal. The most used device is a smartphone, not the desktop as it was with millennial. The most used device is their smartphone. Take a smartphone away from a Gen Z and see what happens. You'll, you'll see how it's almost like an addiction where they get the shakes and the sweats and you know, and you gotta settle them down and give them some caffeine to settle them down a little bit. They like to work as team players, but you're gonna see some conflicting things. You're gonna say, I don't understand this because you just said they're team players. They like to work independently, but bring it together as a team. It's kind of a new concept. Like I'll learn my area, you learn your area, but we're gonna bring it together as a team. But they, they are team players, but they're very good at working independently. They're the best multitasking group ever known. They really can multitask. They can walk and chew gum and do a few other things at the same time. They're really good at multitasking. This is key to us. Personal connections. They value quality over quantity. See, the millennials wanted to have a ton of likes, a ton of hits, a ton of retweets, a ton of these types of things in their particular social media. They liked numbers. It made them feel valued. This generation says, eh, not so much. I want quality. My, my sons have three or four friends total. They know people, but they really want to hang out with a few friends. They want quality relationships, which is great. They want to go deeper in those relationships than quantity and have a lot of people like me, if you will. That, that's key to us in our, in our team building with our teams that we have. And they're a little bit more inclined to be entrepreneurial. Okay, so who are they? I'm going to give this sheet so I won't spend much time on this, but listen to this. This is interesting. They will have 17 jobs in their lifetime. They will live in 15 homes. 
I've had four, and I'm and I'm not moving again. Believe me. <laughs> Uh, when they retire, they will make $222,000 a year. The average house price in the major cities when they retire in 2063 will be $2.5 million for a house. Um, let's see here. They use words like cray cray, deaf. We're going to learn about this. YOLO. Okay? There's 2 billion Gen Zers out there right now. Right now. That's how big we are. This is born 1995 to 2010. I'll give you this. The interesting stat at the bottom is the adulthood line. The 20th century went through childhood, teenager, and adulthood. Three phases of life. The new today's generation has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight phases of life that they go through, in, that, that they define differently. So I'll make this available once again on your way. I'll, I'll put them up here. You can grab them. Okay, Gen Z. So we're on time. They're digital natives. They've, no, they've only grown up with, with Wi-Fi. They've only grown up with uh, the internet. They know how to take a selfie. Their first game they probably played was not a board game like mine, but is a game on, a, on electronic. Board games to my kids are now bored, right? They're boring. They, electronics can office, obviously have a much more fun experience, if you will, not the social one, but they're digital natives. They're re very resourceful. They love YouTube. So my son comes in and says, Dad, I need help with, he comes in the living room and I'm sitting there and he says, Dad, I need help with my calculus too. And I look around like, are you talking to me? <laughs> like, you, you want help with calc too? I probably stopped about algebra, but just so you know. I see, so he goes to YouTube. There's a teacher teaching him how to do this particular problem, the exact same problem he needs to do. He understands it now. They're very resourceful. They can find the answers to anything they want, good and bad. But they're very resourceful. I'm using shark bite plumbing. Ever use shark bite? It's great stuff. Didn't know how to use it. Went to YouTube. Next thing I know, I'm a plumber all of a sudden because of YouTube. But they're very resourceful. They can find whatever they want to without adults even helping them, and they can actually learn that way. And so they're independent. Along with that, they they can check different sites to find things out. They they're teaching them how to themselves how to code now and do these kind of things all online or all through other sources that uh, that, are, that typically came from an educational setting. They're doers and activists because they find out their own answers. They're very they want to jump in and do things. So it says that they're actually going to be asking for forgiveness because they're going to do things ahead of time. Uh, rather than asking for permission. They are doers and activists, and, and we've seen that around. That may be one of the things that you even wrote down. They're realists, but they've never felt safe. They've, they've seen the school shootings. They've seen terrorist acts. They've seen fires and floods and tornadoes, and all this plays together into not feeling safe. They don't feel like they're safe, if you will. Um, and, and this is a, is a problem with their security, if you will. Um, they don't feel their data, their information is safe. They live in what's considered an unsafe world, uh, which I wouldn't say that I, I would have said that growing up for me at all. Um, and that's probably because they can find out about a child abduction in five seconds. They can find out about uh, terrorist acts in, in, you know, th five states over right away. So they, they hear about all these things and they don't, it, it affects them. They don't feel necessarily safe. I asked my kids there, they're in high school, I said, do you feel like that your school could have a school shooting? They said, we feel like it could. I'm like, why don't we think about that? But they really feel like that could happen at their school. Here's the key, I told you, paid, this, this is one thing that's coming up. Their attention span is now down to eight seconds. That's why all those social medias are up. That's why voicemail is way too long. That's why an email is, oh my goodness, I gotta read three paragraphs? Eight seconds is all their attention span is. It doesn't mean they can't go longer than eight, but that's them, that is what they think in eight section spans. It was 12 for the millennial. It's dropped a third. I don't know what that says about the next generation. You're gonna get one word in maybe. If by the time I die, I'll be one word communication. So Snapchat's great, because it's quick, right? It's, it's a few words, Twitter's down to 150 characters, whatever it is, eight seconds. Think about that in your particular area, what you do, whether you coach or even uh, whether you're an athletic director or teach. They are champion multitaskers. Listen to this. They can create a document on the computer, do research on the phone or tablet, take notes on a notepad, finish in front of a TV or laptop, all while FaceTiming with a friend. They really can. I can't do that. Are you kidding me? My wife won't let me talk to her when she's on the phone. She's, <laughs> can't. 
She wants to do one thing at a time. Bless her heart. I can maybe do two. I can chew gum and walk. But these kids really can do all that. They take in all this information that's spinning around them and they're able to multitask. They are altruistic. 60% say they'd like to have a job that makes the world a better place. That's a great thing, I think. I love that they're altruistic, that they're not, they don't, they think the world is somewhere they can make a better place. They want to volunteer, 26% of them volunteer, and they're worried about protecting the environment. That's great about this generation, I think, personally. They're justice-minded, they have a heart for mission. They're, they're connected with many different types of diversity at their schools, so they want to stand up for their friends in different particular areas, whatever it might be. So they're justice-minded. They may be the generation that picks up more voting. The millennial generation got, got soured on voting. So this generation, they think, may be more active politically to vote because they're justice-minded. Justice they like their own space. They like working alone on a project even, and bring it together as a team, as I said. They're not quite as collaborative as, as the millennials. They strive for independence. They say this is good for parents because they will not be living in your home till they're 30 like the millennials will. They want to get out of there earlier. They want to be independent. A it's kind of a shift between the millennial generation and Gen Z. Okay, so what are their values? Honesty is important to them. They're conscious about the environment, as we said. They have a positive outlook on life. They're health conscious. They're family oriented, and they like this work life balance. It's together. Uh, their work, you saw the work life balance that the man talked about in that book. They are health conscious. The other day I was eating a bag of chips. My son said, Do you know what's in there? I said, Del Delicious is what's in there. <laughs> he said, Dad, look at the back of that. What's the first ingredient? I said, I can't pronounce it. Polypropanopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopop
I completely agree with that statement. Facts. I agree. Yee yee. Excuse me. Yee. Wow, that's exciting news. Yee. Congratulations on your baby boy. Yee. What does yee even mean? Yeet is yee. That doesn't help. It's like when fam comes slipping in with their dripping swag, jamming to some sick bop. And no cap, you know these facts are about to be litty fresh to death. You're like, oh, I'm not big mad at that bitty response. Yeet. I don't get it. Weird flex, but okay. I, I don't know. That's how we have to communicate? We're in trouble. So that brings up a point though. The point is this, we have to understand who we're coaching and recruiting today. We really have to understand who they are. We've done all through the data, but now let's dig a little bit deeper into how do we coach them? How do we recruit this generation? They want to know the why. This is not a disrespectful way. They want to know the why. Why do we do this drill? Coach, why do, we, why do we schedule this team? What are you trying to do in this whole process with, with our team, with me? Why do we do this? So the thing is, explain why. Now, the old idea of because I told you so, or because Duke does it, or because uh, the team that just beat us does this, well, some of those things necessarily aren't bad because some of those, you know, you can see a good play and say this is why we do it because it's effective. But they want to know why. They want to know why they do these lifts. What's this lift going to do to my muscles that's going to make me better? And when you explain that in eight second bits, they're with it. They understand that. It's not a disrespectful thing. A couple of my coaches says, well, I think they're being disrespectful. I say, I disagree with you. They're not doing that in a disrespectful manner. They're not saying why in that manner. They really want to know why. This generation wants to know why. You know why they don't want to know why? Because they can go to YouTube and find out the answer to a Calc 2 question in three seconds. They can find the answers to why really quickly. So explain the why to them. It's okay to say, hey guys, we're doing layups because it's the easiest shot in basketball. We missed 14 last week. So we're gonna really, this is why we're focusing more this week on breaking the press. Because St. John's, is this is what they do and we have to focus on this. So it's okay to explain the why. Not just because we do it every single day. Communicate effectively. You can still have your face-to-face, -face, and I think that is be very important to have face-to-face. -face. We can buck that trend because we want to instill values and Christ-centeredness Christ in our student-athletes, but use face-to-face -face for what it's good for. I say if you're not having a preseason, midseason, and postseason one-on-one -on -one with your team, you're probably not communicating with them very well. You need to have uh, some clear set goals ahead of time and expectations for them and let them say what they expect from you and from the team. Use video, use uh, articles, use demonstrations, those types of things for what they're good for, but communicate still face to face. And I think the good old 10 minute check-in, you know, every, every so often with every athlete uh, from a coach is a great thing to do. Be direct. I'm not telling anybody and as a former coach, to, back over bend words, back, to bend over backwards and let your team dictate who you are and what you do. You're still the authority. You still drive the ship. You still are in charge of this squad. You are the authority. The why of what you do doesn't change. The how might a little bit. We didn't have online education when I went to college, but now we have tons of it. How we deliver things may be different, but the why of what we do should still be grounded in who we are and our philosophy. But be direct. Don't spend the old, I, so I had a coach say, hey, can you come over to school and do an audit on, on just some practice things? And I just like some feedback. I said, okay. So I went over there. He's teaching a drill. My back starts to hurt. He's still talking. I'm like, oh my goodness, stop talking. Stop talking. These guys are falling asleep on you. You explain the entire season in to them right now on how to, they're going to do this. They have, they're going to go back to step one and go, what was the first thing you said, coach? A little bit quicker, smaller bits of information at one time, but still be direct. Same thing at halftime. The halftime speeches don't need to be the whole 20 minutes. Say what you want to say. They're going to listen to you and go on and, and with the next thing. Quality over quantity. Remember that one from before? Quality. Quality over quantity. Get the most quality you can uh, out of the time you have with your student athletes. You know, we, we've kind of gone to a policy where we have practices to an hour and a half or less now. First of all, for facility usage for us, but also for the amount of time kids have other things they're involved with. Whether they work, a lot of our students work, or they have, uh, they have involved in other aspects of campus. Quantity 
uh, doesn't necessarily work, quality does. Get the most you can that time. We tell all of our kids, your strength and conditioning is supposed to happen off the, off the practice time. We'll still do drills that do that, but we have a strength and conditioning coach, your time is supposed to be in there with them. We're not gonna use it during practice time. Build independence. By telling them the why and the how and getting them involved, you can build them as independent leaders. Um, it's okay to bring them in. You know one thing that's kind of fun to do? Have them be a coach for a day. Over four years, say, it's, I will let your coach for the day. You get a coach. Now, we're not going to do it before our big game tomorrow. I'm not going to let you coach the day before the game. But be a coach for the day. Design the workout. Design a plan. How would you like to do that? Get involved. Man, they love it when they do that. Matter of fact, we found out when we did this with our track captains, we had to temper them because they wrote way too much in the track workout and people were going to keel over. Let them be involved in it. Let them learn and understand that. Then they have buy-in and that huge with retention because now they feel like they're really part of the program. Promote resiliency. There is a stat in here that I didn't put in there, but this generation does not have grit and resilience. And one of the reasons why is this. Let me give you an example. I've never seen this in 20 years, but we had a tennis kid with a concussion. Now you think it'd be something really awesome like he tripped over the net, diving for a ball, and hit his head in the front. No. Twin brothers. One served the ball into his brother's hit back of his head and knocked him out for four seconds. Never seen it before. So this happened on the road. Parents were hot. They were mad. There wasn't a trainer on site. They felt like our coach didn't attend enough time to the one son that was there, even though he did, and so forth. So they came to my office and went to have a meeting. So I sat, and I talked to the two boys off the side, and we were fine, but the parents were not fine. So we came to my office, they said, okay, you know, I'm gonna listen here. And so they started talking, and the parents did all the talking. So I finally looked over at Trevor, one of the two twins, and I said, Trevor, and I asked him a question. And he looked at his parents. I said, Trevor, don't look at your parents. I'm asking you this question. I want you to answer this question. Did you feel like you were attended to, helped, and what coach did was appropriate? And he, he kept looking at his parents because he wanted to say yes. But he was so worried and so insulated about his parents that he wasn't sure how to answer the question. When they left that meeting, I thought, I'm going to pray for Trevor and Travis because they're in trouble. They have no resiliency. Basically because what the parents, us, have done is insulate them so much that they don't have any grit. They don't have the resiliency. So I challenge you to this. Find ways to develop grit and resilience in your athletes. There's a great book called Grit. Um, and there's a lot of stuff out there on mental toughness. But grit is something this generation needs. They need to understand how to fight through these things on their own um, and, and not through parents or others who have always helped them. Now, Krisha Parker is at the University of Georgia. She surveyed uh, male and female soccer, Gen Z soccer players, 5,000 of them, and asked them, what's the four things that you think are most important in a coach? The four things. Four top characteristics. What do you, just in your mind, just once again, what do you think they said? What, what do I want to see in a coach? Think for a second. If you were to say, what, what do you want to see in a coach? And I'll reveal the data in a second. This was a PhD doc, uh, project. All right, <clears throat> here we go. Does not yell remains calm. Involves team in the decision making. Is competent in their sport, so they have knowledge, they understand how to coach the sport, and they're caring and encouraging. Does not yell, remains calm, involves us in decision making, is caring, encouraging, and has competency in their sport or knowledge of it. Now, in what order do you suppose that is? So, think about that. In what order would you put those four that they thought were the most important? Okay, here we go. Coach does not yell at them, remains calm. How many times have you seen the coach blow up an official because of a call or not a call? Or get mad at a student athlete because they dribbled the ball off their foot like they meant to do that? Which, I'm not sure why you get mad at a student athlete for making a mistake, but it's understandable, right? They've seen this. You know that 70% of Gen Z's quit because of coaching conduct. Also, you see it with AAU and club sports, and you know what? My son had a soccer game last night. My, this is a true story. I can show you this on my phone. It got ugly in the last 30 seconds to a team we were playing that we'd just beaten before to make to the State Cup. And she shows me, she said, this is the end of the game. And my dear wife doesn't know a ton about sports. You think she'd know more as an athletic director, but she's filming the field, and there's one team on the field. It's my son's team. And they're kicking the soccer ball back and forth. And I said back to her, I said, you didn't film it right because the other team's not in the field. She said, they walked off the field with a minute to go. They quit. They were mad. 
and the coach was screaming and there was cards and all kinds of stuff going on and a youth U16 soccer game coaches kids see this and they and it's, it's disturbing to them they don't want to be like that they're about justice and altruistic sometimes they're seeing the opposite second thing they want you to be caring and encouraging and I'm guessing this is the best group in America to be caring and encouraging I know that our coaches in the NCCA care about their athletes, and I'm sure they do in NCAA and NAI too. I'm not knocking any of those coaches, but they want to care. They want you to care about them. The sport's important, but hopefully that's secondary to them as a human being. Uh, and I've heard stories even now, I just heard a story this morning about one of our coaches at the NCCA at Geneva who demonstrated to a kid how much he cared about him in the midst of a tough situation. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. We've all heard that before, and that's the truth. Third, they want you to be competent in your sport. You gotta know what you're talking about. They want you to be up, you know, up on the latest trends and knowing how to coach them because they chose to come to a school uh, to play for your particular coach or for you. And they want to know how they can be better. They want to know that you know how to make them better. And then lastly, they want to be involved in decision making. It's not a negative thing. You're not turning the reins over them, but what can you do to get them involved and team decision making. It can be even like, what do you guys, where do, we, where do you guys want to eat this year? Where are some places? I just pick the restaurants, but you tell me where you want to eat. You tell me when you, you know these types of things. Get involved in decision making. Not just your captains, but even more so, your younger, your younger students. Communicate with social media. So we use Team Snap. It's awesome because we got dinged on our evaluations from our student athletes that coaches weren't communicating enough. So I went back and said, how can we do this? Team Snap's free up to a certain point. So our football coach says, practice has moved to five o'clock today because of rain, boom. All 85 kids get that at the same time. Or, uh, you know, speaker in chapel today is so-and-so, expect to see you there, boom. And it's all there, the rosters are there, the names are there, the phone numbers, contact information. It's a great way, Team Snap. My son's soccer team uses Team Snap too. There's, there's Sports Engine, there's others out there too you might use. Communi you can communicate through that quickly with them. You can use video. So we have a strength and conditioning coach who put all of our things on YouTube. So how do you do a power clean? How do you do this? It's all there for them so they can see it, watch the video, so coaches don't have to sit there every time and demonstrate these types of things. It's, there it is for you right there. You can do your plays on there. You can um, use video for certain things that you want to teach and educate your kids with. But use it. It's free. And you can have a secure YouTube channel that's only, it's password protected. So only your athletes potentially can see that, or your coaches. Connect face to face. Don't miss those times. Like I say, preseason, midseason, postseason, just recommendation for people. But use those times to connect with your kids. They value face to face. They really want you to, to be involved in their life and, and face to face. Okay, let's wrap this up with recruiting. So how do you get these, knowing the language they speak and the eight seconds you have with them, what's that look like for recruiting? They think how you treat them and communicate them is far more important than what your facilities look like. Sure, facilities help people come to your institutions. No, no one's going to argue that. But you can have, there's people that win, the, the two years ago, the Division II, I think it was Division II, National Track and Field Champions did not have a track on campus. They didn't have a track on campus. They ran at the local high schools where they trained. They don't even, so you, can't, you couldn't say the facilities brought them there for that because they didn't even have the facility they needed to train on. How you communicate with them is more important. They want a relationship with you. And, and you sure they can see your, your campus and those types of things, but it starts with a relationship. Facilities don't win games. Coaching and playing players win games. They think how your team treats them while they're on campus is very important too. They want to feel special while they're on campus. I mean, they want to feel like they're important to your campus. So we say strategically put your recruits with people that are good recruiters. We have them on each team. You know who they are. This Mitch for us is great. We want kids to stay with Mitch because he's awesome. He represents Northwestern very well for us. Unfortunately, we can't put everybody with Mitch, but we have certain people that recruit. I say this too, don't roll out the red carpet for your recruits. That's a false representation of who they are. You don't roll it out for your student athletes, do you? Don't roll it out for your recruits. They need to see who you really are and, and how you treat them while they're on campus uh, is very important. The parents are very important. 
Let me show you another quick story. Katie DeWitt played basketball for us. She transferred from Drake University, Division I, got hurt, didn't want to play Division I anymore, so she came to Northwestern. Katie was a very good player for us and went on to coach at Dort. She was a head coach at Dort. Katie received the 30 under 30 award for being one of the top female coaches under 30 years old. She was an excellent coach. She, their, her charge was to take the team of 17 for enrollment purposes, and they wanted to, give her to th get it to 32. That's a big, daunting task. Katie said, you know what? I'm a former student athlete. My mom helped make decision. I'm going to start recruiting moms. I'm going to start writing hand notes to moms. I'm going to spend more time recruiting the mother. Not, not, not discounting the dad either, but spending time with the mother and the student athlete. Within two years, she had 32 student athletes on her, in her team. I thought, that's a great idea. So the, the parents are still very important in the decision making process. Although millennials, they were very important because Gen Z's want to be a little more independent. Don't neglect recruiting parents. You probably already know that, but even the handwritten note to the mom and dad saying, this is Coach Jones, I'm gonna make sure that, that Sally is well taken care of, make sure she's in, that she's growing spiritually while she's here and athletically and physically and academically while she's at my, my university. They think you talk too much during your phone calls. I'm sure that's the same thing with me. They think we talk too much. They want eight seconds. So find strategic things to talk about more often. They, want, they don't mind them more often, but not the long phone call. Not the long phone call. So find the topic you're going to talk about with your recruits. Make it short and sweet. And you can use text. Because you know what? That's the best way to ha half the time. You guys know it's to get a hold of somebody. Even more so. And now you can have cell phones. When I, was, I used to teach school, and we, you couldn't have a cell phone in our school during the day. It was, it was taken away from you if you showed up. Now they encourage you to bring your cell phones because they use them in class, actually, for, for assignments and things. So you can get a hold of them and text them saying, hey, hope you have a great game tonight, Billy. Uh, rooting you on. See you at state tournament or whatever. Coach Z. They think letters and emails to promote your school are too bland. They really don't read the, the email, the mail. It's junk mail to them. A typed letter to them about your particular campus is archaic. My son's going through the recruiting process. He gets those. He doesn't even open most of them. Doesn't even open most of them. I'm like, what do they say? I don't know. Well, don't you want to know? Not really. Huh. He goes, like, they'll email me or text me anyway, Dad, so it's not that big a deal. It's like, wow. I got three recruiting letters my entire high school, and I pinned those up on my wall. And they were typewritten, because I'm sure everybody else in my high school got the same letter. I didn't know it. I thought I was special. But, you know, the coach may have used ink to sign the bottom of the letter on mine. They don't, they don't read that anymore. Those that are too bland, they'll figure out, they will research you. They know how to get the information on your website. So have a strong website presence, because that's where they're getting their information. They think it's great when you do consistently talk with them, though. They do, think, they do like the fact that you're not giving up on them, that you're texting once in a while and saying, hey, great game last night against Williams. Was, you guys did a great job. Um, and I, I saw maybe you got injured. Are you all right? Is everything OK? Just that, that type of thing. So just short, the short snippets, but staying with them consistently. However, I'm going to go back one point. I'm going to buck the trend. I believe that faith is the most important thing in your life. I believe family is second. I believe your job is somewhere after that. At some point in time, if you're recruiting a kid, you don't need to go to every game they have. They gotta make up their mind. I tell my coach, stop going to games. You've seen eight of that kid's games. You've seen four of their games. If they haven't decided now, go to your daughter's recital. Go spend time with your, take your dog for a walk tonight. If they don't come to Northwestern because you didn't spend two more games at them, sorry. But life, don't, don't let that overbalance your faith in your family. And, and when I say family, if you, even if you're not married, it's you, your family. It's great when you write them personal handwritten letters and notes. Inside secret, I'm gonna spill the beans here, but I don't think that uh, any, it's different than what you guys do. And December, I tell all my coaches to give me your top five prospects from your team. I'm gonna write a handwritten note over Christmas break. So I get the card out, note card out. Uh, Dear Chris, uh, Coach Jones says you're a great player, a great fit at Northwestern. I hope to see you. Take, please come see a campus visit. Throw my business card in there and mail it all out. So I get writer's cramp sometimes, but I write a personal note to each one of them. And I make our, I mean, we make our president write 20 of them. We bargain 20 and we give him some gear if he does it, right? Personal notes to somebody. You know what? I haven't gotten a personal letter from a person in a long time. When I do and I see a handwritten address in there, I open and see what it is. If it comes from U.S. Bank, you know, it's probably another junk mail, whatever it might be. But handwritten notes are, have quality, have a quality uh, aspect with student athletes now. So I recommend you still send a few of those. 
handwritten ones, uh, you know, out and get other people. Get get your AD if you're not the AD to do it, or your president, or your student life somebody, or your, a dean to say we really have to come study biology at our school. They think you give them too much to do during a campus visit. By the way, 78% of people that come to campuses, you made it harder for them to say no to you. So get them on your campus. But don't overwhelm them. Send them to chapel, send them to a class, uh, have them meet with a the coach, give them some free time actually, so they can roam around on their own. Well, our admissions used to have this regimented thing where they went through all these things. I said, you know what, they're leaving here overwhelmed. Give them a little bit of information, let them roam around, have them visit with a professor or class, and keep it, keep it short and sweet. But get them on campus. Make sure you get them on campus. That is a huge, huge uh, selling factor. All right, that's a wrap. But let me leave with three things. So hopefully you got one or two things you can take out of this. I know how presentations are. Hopefully some things out here will help you, even discussions on your campus with, okay, let's really effectively look at how we're recruiting, how we're coaching, how we're um, teaching, um, and how we're interacting with Gen Zs. Um, and I think this PowerPoint will be available. I need to put my references on. I, haven't, I didn't send it to Kelly before I put this on here, but I have references for, for the data that was used in here. Three things. I like to say this. Don't fear a judge's generation, believe in them. I've got three of them at home, they might be on one of your campuses if they're not on mine. I hope they're on one of your campuses if they're not on one of mine. I hope you believe in my son and my daughter if they're on your campus. You don't fear them, even though they're, they've got goofy things that they're gonna do, but you believe in them. You empower them. This is the next generation of, of our, of our godly, godly leaders uh, on, on this earth. Craig Rochelle is a pastor of Life Church. I love this. You do not delegate tasks to the next generation because you create followers. You delegate authority so you create leaders. Give them authority, responsibility, so they can become leaders. Some of you probably did that to you at some point in your life because you're all leaders. Do the same thing to this generation. Don't tolerate them, embrace them. Lastly, let me end with this verse. Psalm 71, 18. Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. That is our responsibility to train the next generation. It's a, it's a, it's a responsibility that God's placed in us to embrace, to uphold, and to uh, encourage this next generation in life. And they're ready for it, and that's our role to do that. So hopefully a few things have hit. I have, uh, I'll, I have this up here if you like this handout, kind of an infographic on uh, Gen Z, but I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.